Hello, DDD Europe. The room is packed. <laughs> this is insane. Cool. Um, I'm so happy to be here. Um, this is actually my very first time at DDD Europe. And I kind of need to let you in on this little secret, which I feel I'm a little bit obliged to like share with you guys. But like, let's not tell the organizers. But I'm actually not a DDD expert, so <laughs> I'm not sure like what I like. It was a surprise to me that I was invited to this event, but I'm pretty sure we will have a fun time together because what I'm going to talk about today is how your brain is wired. So how are you learning new languages or new programming languages for that matter? So hopefully there's something in it for all of you guys. So what am I doing here and why this talk? Well, I am Simone de Geit. I, I graduated in 2015 as a speech and language therapist, but actually immediately after I already switched to IT. I'm currently a Java and Kotlin developer for Open Value. And of course I heard about the buzzword DDD uh, last couple of years. It has been singing around everywhere in the IT industry, right? So I did my research, I've read some articles, I've read some blogs, maybe saw a YouTube video here or there, but apart from that, I don't work with it in my day-to-day -day practice. So if I say something like funny, please <laughs> bear with me. Um, today, we are going to talk about memory storage, about how your brain is capturing stuff and how you can use that in your advantage whenever you are in the process of learning. So some learning techniques, um, implicit, explicit, um, it will all come along. So before I really dive in, I want to give you the opportunity to grab a pen or paper or a laptop or a mobile phone. It doesn't really matter, but we all know like it's day three, right? For most of us. So we have had a lot of information input already and we need to help our brain a little bit when we want to capture all that data and want to use it maybe next week or tell a colleague about it maybe on Monday. So. Um, Feel free to grab that at every given moment that you feel like it. All right, then we can really start. Memory, data, we process it all the time, right? And the funny thing is the first memory storage that we have is actually the one that we're, I think, the less likely to, to know. It is what we call the sensory memory. Now, at this moment, you're probably looking at me or this incredible, cool, big screen behind me. Um, and that's probably all you see, right? Or is it? If I would now ask you to remain looking at me or the screen, so don't change your sight. But now I ask you, can you please tell me the color of the t-shirt of your neighbor? Without looking, oh no, I saw you looking away. No, no, <laughs> don't cheat. <laughs> Without looking away, you probably most likely can, right? Because suddenly you expand your attention to further away. I can see my fingers swingling. And the funny thing is, all that information, even though we didn't put our attention to it, it was already in our sight. We didn't change anything. So we went to a sensory memory storage place. Same goes when you're dreaming or asleep. Probably you don't smell a lot of things, right? But when there would be a fire and there would be smoke, at one point you would get awake because suddenly it got important that you needed to wake up and suddenly it came into your attention. So what does this have to do with IT and how can we relate to IT? Can I see some hands who is a developer? So who writes code or did in the past? Oh yes, <laughs> oh nice. I didn't calculate for this, but this is amazing. <laughs> so most of the room is a developer. So that, that makes my life a little bit easier because like the reference will, uh, will be <laughs> uh, gotten. So, what, uh, what I want to compare it to is the sensory memory looks a little bit like the dot folders. So dot folders are folders that are within your project uh, and normally you don't, you don't see them. They are not important. But whenever there is something going on or when you put your attention to it, you maybe do a shortcut, then they come into your attention, right? 
Now, with the sensory memory, we have a lot of senses, right? The five senses uh, you all know. And for development, the most important one is what we call the iconic memory. Iconic is for sight, for your view. And we use it daily to like read our code, maybe read an article, doesn't really matter. Um, and the cool thing is now that we know that we take all this information in and that is actually being stored in a dot folder or in our sensory memory, we can use that knowledge. Instead of immediately diving into the method that you want to read or to the starting of your article, first take a second. Step back, glance over the page, glance over your code class, and then start to read. Maybe in university, when you read uh, scientific papers, you also learned that whenever you read a paper, you don't start at the top. You first glance over it. Maybe you read some chapter titles before you really dive in. So that's what goes here as well. It will give you more context when you start reading later on. Now, we have that sensory memory. And from that point, it's a logical step to our short-term memory. And short-term memory is a place where things end up when we pay attention to it. Now, we all have seen this cute little fish, Dory. She is from the Disney movie Finding Nemo. She's generated with Dolly, so uh, she's a little bit different. But uh, we all recognize her, and we all love her, right? She is helpful, she is kind, she is friendly, super happy. But she has one tiny issue. Like she cannot remember anything you said to her past the here and now. So like you can't have a conversation with her here, but if you want to refer to something that happened before, she has no recollection of it. And that looks a little bit like our short-term memory. Now, the short-term memory can be compared to a RAM. A RAM is a small storage place where you can store a limited amount of data for a limited amount of time. And that is very true for the short-term memory because a short-term memory can only hold two to six chunks at the time with every chunk having a time to live for about 30 seconds. That's not very long, right? And it's actually funny because Research uh, in the years 50, like 1950 something, they believed the chunks were up to five to nine, but recent research shows actually that's even less. So we need to be efficient with how we use this data, right? So what is a chunk? A chunk is a little bit like an abstract term, right? Well, it is because it is. A chunk can be anything. A chunk can be a letter, a chunk can be a word, or it can be an entire concept. So you can put DDD inside a chunk, but you could also look at this example. This is a line of code with a data type of string and some letters. If I would now cover it up and I would ask you, grab your pen and paper, can you please write down the line of code? I think a lot of you guys will have a hard time exactly remembering the variable name. And why is that? Well, first of all, it's a word we don't know. And secondly, the sequence of letters don't make sense. They are put in such a random order that it's even hard to pronounce. You look sure. Like it, it's not, it doesn't make sense. Only the O and the A are like naturally chunked together because immediately when we read it, we, we perceive it as a sound ooh. But you already see that the last chunk, like the last letter fall off, right? Very different from, um, from the example, Boolean is active is true. And that is why we should be careful with abbreviations. I've heard it the last couple of days multiple times that we want to have a domain language or a shared language model where we all understand the same terms. And I also heard already somebody saying we should avoid abbreviations because like, not, it's not self-explanatory. So we have two reasons why we don't want to use abbreviations too often. One, it's not self-explanatory. And two, they take up a lot of space inside your short-term memory. 
Now, the second example with the, is bullying, uh, with the bullying uh, line of code is, as I said, it's a longer line of code, like more characters, but it fits in less chunks. Now, if we would introduce some design patterns, we could even make it smaller. If we say, every time I write a variable name of the data type Boolean, I start it with the verb is. Then suddenly, I can chunk Boolean and is together because they always come together. All right, so now we did like, we did a little exercise. We have some tricks and tips on how to be more efficient with our chunk usage, but six chunks, still not a lot, right? So we need something else. And you will not be surprised that from a short-term memory, we go to our long-term memory. Now I have another Disney analogy for you. The elephants of Jungle Book. We all seen the elephants, right? They, they are like super wise and a little bit arrogant. And they say that they never forget stuff. And in that sense, it can be compared to a hard disk. It's a storage where you can save a lot of data for an indefinite period of time. So it, it saves data permanently. But how does that then work? How does it end up there? Well, let's look at an example. Let's say you see this creature for the very first time. You've never seen it before. So that means no encoding, no memory. So you need someone or a sign or something that tells you this creature is a shark. So now you encode it and hey, look there, long-term memory. But I haven't been to the zoo for a while. I haven't been scuba diving for a while. Now the next time I come across this creature, I'm like, I've learned this, it's on the tip of my tongue, but nah, I just don't know. I don't have consolidation. So I need to go over it again. I need to be told again, or I need to read it again in order to encode it again and make my pathway to the long-term memory stronger. So that at one point, hopefully in time, it gets consolidated and I can actually retrieve my long-term memory. Now, here comes a very cool thing. I think it's one of the most mind-blowing stuff I've learned in the recent year. Um, and it is that recent research has actually shown and proven that we never forget stuff. Once stuff is in your long-term memory, it stays there. The only issue is that we fail to retrieve it. So, <laughs> yeah, small detail, but hey, who's counting? So you can now call your mom or your partner and tell them, so, I'm not stupid. I just failed to retrieve it, but it's there. I didn't forget the groceries, no, but I just failed to retrieve it. All right, so how does it then work? It is a little bit like a forest. Let's say you stand here in front of an untouched forest. No one has ever been there. So the first time you want to make your way through, you need to push the branches aside. You need to find yourself a way. And then at the end of the turn, you're like super happy you did the job. Next time it will be easier, right? So when you come back the next day or the next week, even though you might still have the scratches on your arm to prove that you made your way through, you can't see the pathway anymore. It's already overgrown. It's only when you revisit it time after time that at one point it gets like this little, we call it in Dutch elephant pathway. Is that an English term? Is that something you, no, no. What is it? Cow's path? Yeah. Yeah, just walking over it and then like for naturally the path consists. Yeah, no, cow's path that exists. <laughs> and when you go over it enough of times, then at one point it hopefully gets consolidated. Pretty cool. But how is it then that for certain words, 
I like you only have to tell me once and I already get it. Like it's just easy peasy. But the other terms or concepts, I need to go over it again and again because I just cannot grasp the content. For that, in order to understand that, we need to know how our brain or how our memory is stored. So we now learn where it is stored, but how is it stored? So it is stored a little bit like a network structure, like this big mind map of things. So let's take this person as an example. Uh, normally there are other terms on the screen, but I now tried to make it DDD relevant. <laughs> Did a great job, right? Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> if something is wrong, let me please know afterwards. Um, so yeah, uh, this person knows all of these words. And now this person wants to know about events. So can I see some thumbs? Like, will this be easy for this person or like not easy for this person to learn about events? Easy, not easy. I think majority easy, I see. I do see like 30% not easy. It is relatively, making a little bit like generic picture here, relatively easy. Like he knows a lot of concepts are already related to, to the event, so he can couple it. He has a lot of hooks that already can connect to that term. Very different from when this person wants to learn about a hacker because that like somebody bad <laughs> that wants to like hack your system or want to do something bad to your system nobody would ever do that right so that would be like a new term it would take a longer period of time to uh, consolidate that now you might also have noticed that i put the colors in coloring and i didn't only do that because it looks fun but i did that because a lot of people they retrieve their memory of colors as visualizations, as the color of the color and not as the word of the color. Now, that gives a little bit away how we save this mind map. This mind map doesn't only consist of words. It's a mind map of all our senses. So you can also include visualizations, smells, feelings like uh, if you remember uh, if you think about a cat, you can maybe already feel how the cat is feeling. And all of these senses are hooks, extra hooks within your mind map. So the more hooks you can place, the easier it is to retrieve it. That is why if I want to learn about that shark from a few slides ago, it makes a lot of sense that I also see the shark and that I don't only read about the shark, but it makes it easier to retrieve because I have more hooks. Now, I, I play some pictures here of Java uh, and, and a stream. Very, very delicate stream. Um, <laughs> but um, they, these are visualizations, right? But as I said, it can be anything. Maybe, maybe when I think of Java, I actually can smell the coffee that I drink every morning because we developers, we love coffee, right? Like don't take, take our coffee away. All right, this is what we call in linguistics contextual association. It is a correlation between sensory perspectives that connect to a meaning and that connect together. And that makes it easier to learn. So we use that when, when I was a therapist, we use that on our clients. So how can we use that in our IT practice? Now, I have an example, and this example is from the coding language Java. So you can't forget about that, but it's just an example. So in one of the recent versions of Java, we introduced records and records is like the new cool new thing everybody wants to use it so we want to learn about it right well we're in luck records is already a very easy word to remember right very a lot more easy than sun Piki cs 11. like it doesn't make sense it's not self-explanatory it takes up a lot of chunks i already have a hard time so the fact that I'm learning about records and that the naming is easy, already a big plus. Now we can move along to the semantical and syntactical meaning. Now, I can read about this in a blog, right? But how can I use the contextual association that I just talked about in my learning process? Well, first of all, you can start maybe by making it a practice 
that every time that you read an article or when you read a blog, that you read it out loud. I tell you why. The moment you read it, you process text once, right? The fact that you want to speak it out loud means that your brain needs to process whatever it's read, it read and needs to actively apply and speak it out again. So this is very efficient for two reasons. One, your brain processes the same text multiple times. So you don't need to read it three times, but you can just like read it once. And secondly, because you need to actively apply it, you need to have more focus. So it's less likely that your mind will drift off while reading the blog to something else, to the coffee that you want to make, because it takes up more energy in order to process it. Now, if you're a person that works a lot at the office, you can get some annoyed faces from some colleagues. So what to do then? Well, you can also write a summary, for example. We all did it in college, right? And the fun thing about like writing a summary is that when you wrote it for an exam, for example, the fact that you already wrote the summary was a big part of your learning process. Probably you could already get like this, like like tiny like uh, like a good grade, uh, maybe not the best grade, but like you could like pass the exam just across the border with just writing the summary. Now these are things that you can do as a practice, which are kind of easy. But I also talk, uh, talk, talked about the visualizations, right? And that's a lot harder because in, in IT, a lot of things are not something you immediately have a picture of because they're abstract, they're concepts. That doesn't matter. <laughs> We have creative contextual association, and this is the process where you self think, uh, where you self create something. Like it doesn't matter that it doesn't exist. Your brain doesn't doesn't mind that it's not something that really belongs together. If you explicitly tell your brain that those two things now belong together, it will belong together. So whenever you're learning about new concept even though it doesn't, it isn't a real visualization, it makes a lot of sense in the process of learning to create that visualization. So how do we do that in our previous example? Well, you could say, okay, but I don't need to make a visualization because I know a record, right? I'm a big music fan. I have my visualization. Well, in this example, could work like I, I would in this example I would argue that you could get away with this and why is that well if we're in front of that forest right so I'm now at my starting point my starting point is a visualization and I want to get to a semantical meaning of that visualization now if I place the record visualization to my Java record exp uh, explanation I have two pathways from that starting point. One, a musical record, and two, a Java record. But because I'm in my IDA, I'm like at, in my work environment, my brain will have a, not a very tough time deciding which pathway I should take. Like it's, it's pretty, pretty easy that it will take the pathway of the IT environment because it's already in the IT environment. But that's very different from when you make visualizations that are about two things within the IT environment. And that is, I think, where you guys know a lot more about, like the fact that you make that domain language and that things need to be in a bounded context and that it needs to be make sense so that everybody knows what it means within that context. So that's also with making a visualization for learning purposes. So you can create something yourself. It doesn't matter. As I said, you can create any symbol or picture that you would like. In this example, I created a file with bars because a record is a data class with immutable data. So the data, the file is captured and there are bars like you cannot change it. I just did something. Like you are all creative people, you can think of something yourself. Just be careful that you create a visualization per context and per semantical meaning. All right, then my therapist's heart goes out, the kids. 
Uh, as a speech and language therapist, I learned a lot about how I need to like help kids uh, learning a new language. And what I find fun about learning from kids it, is that they learn intuitively. They learn in a natural way. Nobody has taught them how to learn. And even though I'm standing here with tips and tricks on learning, sometimes we're overthrown with tips and tricks on how you can learn better and stuff. But also that takes like time to, to learn and it takes capacity to learn. How can we learn in a more intuitive way? How can we learn less, like more effortlessly? So for that, I go back to the children. How do they learn and how can, how can we apply that? Now, first of all, what kids do is they love to parrot. So from a certain age, they start to repeat everything they hear around them. And they can be like fun words. It can be swear words, <laughs> less fun, uh, anything actually. And that's, <laughs> that's great because then they really actively apply it. And we as developers, we do it also all the time. We all parrot our body stack overflow, right? Everybody does it. But I can argue if it's really actively applying, if you're simply copy pasting. Because parroting is a form of actively applying. So as reading that article out loud, it's the fact that you hear something, that you process it and that you repeat it yourself. If you go to Stack Overflow and you read it and then you do like Ctrl C, Ctrl V or Command C and Command V, you don't actively apply it. So take a second, maybe place your editor at one side of the screen, your Stack Overflow at the other side of the screen and type it out, type it over. Even though it takes longer of time, it will be less likely that the next time you need to Google for it again. Saves your time, right? So now that kids start parroting. The funny thing is that they don't only repeat what they hear at that moment, but after that, they're going to try it out everywhere. Like they, like every cat is now a dog. Uh, everything in the grocery store is chips. Uh, they are just going to try it out. And that's what we should do as well. Uh, we heard yesterday morning uh, from Shin that uh, everything that we talk about is from our own perspective, right? Everything I talk about, everything she talked about, uh, it's, it's covered with this, this glue of my own view on the world. And that's why if you read an article on something, that happens as well, right? So we should try it out in different ways. We should read multiple blogs to get a more full sight of the entire world and of the real meaning of it. Now, although this is fun and this is nice, if that kid, would go out in the world and would start parroting and would start like applying it everywhere, but would have no control system, no feedback system. Yeah, it would have a tough time as an adult. He would have learned a lot of faulty stuff, right? And that's pretty shitty because it's hard to unlearn. We don't have a process manager that simply cleans up everything that was faulty. Because as we just learned, whatever is in your long-term memory stays in your long-term memory. So how does that work then? Well, the process of unlearning is not as much unlearning as it is to learn something new again. So what you need to do is the old pathway, you need to let be overgrown again, and you need to create a new pathway to the new meaning or the new concept that you want to learn. But that's hard because then we go back to those two pathways. And that's why it's so hard to unlearn stuff because for a temporary period of time, you have two pathways leading to the thing that you first learned and that you now want to relearn. And that's why it's so hard. So we want to prevent that as much as possible, right? So that's why we should find someone to correct us. Don't be afraid of that. Like, just find it yourself a mentor or be a mentor for someone else and be careful of bad exams. And that's why you also should look into the multiple solutions, right? All right, last thing that I want to talk about with kids is that they start easy. So kids start not with the word refrigerator. 
even I have a hard time pronouncing that word. They start with mommy, daddy, uh, maybe ball, little words that are easily pronounceable, easily to get and grasp. And that was what we should do in IT the same. Because when I want to learn about DDD, I don't want to start with event sourcing. I want to start with entities, value objects, stuff like that, like the easy stuff. I first want to have a base. I first want to have uh, like a solid starting point before really diving in. And that's why it makes sense and it's, it's, it will help if when you're learning a new concept, you try to find or you draw it out yourself to see if you can find a hierarchical structure. This is an example for Java, uh, but it, that you can find like, okay, I want to learn about this concept. In order to learn this concept, do I understand the base principles that I need to know before diving into this? So for example, I will zoom in a little bit, is that if I want to learn about, uh, let's say, uh, am I, ah, yeah. Oh, this is tough. Quarkus. <laughs> if I want to learn about Quarkus, uh, that I first learn about microservices and I first get what a framework is and I should at least know what Java is. So make sure you know those principles because otherwise it will be tough to learn. It will be very frustrating and you will be feeling like you didn't get the entire point without it really being your fault, because you just didn't have the right base to build upon. And that is where we get to the next thing. So we talked about those memory storages, right? And we also kind of learned like the pathway, so how it ends up there, but more on like a functional way. But I also, as a developer, I want to have a technical, like how does it end up there? So. We, are have, we do have this missing link, and this missing link is what we call the working memory. And researchers, uh, researchers are a little bit indecisive. Some say the working memory is the same as this uh, short-term memory. It's one and the same thing. Other researchers believe it's, uh, they are two separate entities. So. It's just, it's non-conclusive at the moment. Uh, it's whatever you want to, what, what you want to believe in, kind of. Uh, and, but I do get the confusion because the working memory can only hold two to six chunks at a time. That sounds familiar, right? We heard that before. So I get like the, the confusion or I do get like why people would say that it might be the same thing. But for my presentation and because it makes it more clear to me, I love the explain, uh, explanation of that. It would be a separate entity because I believe in storage places and, and process engines. So uh, for me, this makes more sense. So uh, that's what we go for today. Now, we've all been learning a new concept. And as I just told about keeping it simple, we all went to that place where we were majorly frustrated. <laughs> I just cannot grasp my head around it. And it's maybe not even that it's, it's so hard or anything. I, I just, I, it's too much. I you cannot consume it all. And that is because of those six chunks, right? Because research shows that whenever you are learning or you want to process in the working memory, you want to process a seven chunk, that seven chunk is not there. So either you are not processing that chunk or you need to drop a previous chunk, which then that doesn't get processed. So it's, it's a trade-off. And that's why we should be a little bit kind to ourselves and to our fellow colleagues or maybe our junior colleagues even more. Be careful because it might sound like you might get like impatient with yourself or your colleague, but it's a very natural thing that at one point you can just not take any more. And six chunks aren't that much, right? So I talked with you guys about a forest. I told you that we can consolidate it. But what I didn't tell you yet is that we can create 
a highway. <laughs> Pretty cool, right? A highway is awesome because highways skip the working memory. With a highway, you can automatically retrieve whatever you have in your long-term memory without needing to take up a chunk in your working memory. So that's great. So when I hear people saying, oh yeah, I don't need to learn about this concept, or I don't need to learn this syntax within programming languages or anything because I can just Google it, that is true. Like I, I'm not going to argue that you cannot find it on the internet. But I can argue that it's inefficient and it, that it will make you a better developer if you automate stuff. Because at the moment you automate certain syntaxes or certain concepts, you have more space to grow as a person, to grow as a developer. So maybe you are still a little bit skeptical. Like we, we are developers, so, so I love the skepticism that mostly comes with that. Um, so I, I have another thing to, to really get you engaged. Now, Philippe Hermans wrote a book, The Programmer's Brain, and it's a great book. If you like this topic, uh, I would definitely recommend to read. It's very practical as well, like how you can uh, use all this kind of knowledge in your day-to-day -day practices. And what she also talks about is that lately, hold your horses, 20% of a developer's time is spent on interruptions. Don't tell your boss. <laughs> That's an entire day if you work five days a week. And the last couple of years, it has grown worse because we work remote. And where we complained back in the days, we complained like, yeah, when I work at the office, it's so loud and people come to my desk. Nowadays, it's even worse when we work remote and we're in a meeting, we're also checking our mail, we're also doing some code, we're also Googling on the internet. like. We are doing so many things at the same time that our focus and our flow is often interrupted. And when it's interrupted, it takes about 50 minutes to get back into that flow. So when you automate stuff from your long-term memory retrieval, you don't need to get out of your flow. You don't need to get to that browser in order to Google it. And you will be less likely to maybe see that notification or to maybe also check something else. So now I got you all engaged. Everybody wants to build some highways. Um, this is a very abstract picture of Dali of creating a highway. Um, did a great job. Um, so we are going to build ourselves some highways. And how do we do that? Well, let's look at some practical tips. First tip, think before you search. This changed. I wouldn't say my life, like I would make it very big, it, it would change my life, but it would it definitely changed uh, the, the efficiency of my learning process. I've been doing this now since a couple of years um, and I do see a real difference from before that period of time and now because when we look at it from that forest perspective, you would be at the beginning of your pathway and you would not see the end. Like you, you cannot see the entire pathway. You can see the first steps. But instead of immediately turning away and going to Google and asking like, okay, what, what do I need to do? Where's my pathway going? You first try to take a few steps on that pathway. And very likely that you maybe can even take one or two steps more than you initially thought of. Making sure that that path gets more consolidated that time so that next time it's less likely that you can, that you again cannot see the pathway. And of course it can be that you're at one point in your pathway and you're like, it's all dark for us. I, I don't know where I'm going. Okay, th then, then go to your friend Google. That's fine. It's all good. And uh, like you also don't want to learn like bad examples, right? So you don't want to learn something wrong. So I'm not saying that Google is not your friend, but I'm just saying first try it out yourself. Secondly, frequency. Who all uses Duolingo? 
Nah, yeah, 50%. Okay, for the people not knowing what Duolingo is, Duolingo is this language program, and the strong feature of Duolingo is that the lessons that it offers aren't necessarily long. Actually, they are like three minutes each or something, like they're very short lessons. But the thing they do is that they trigger you to revisit it every day. So every day you take one or two lessons and you repeat that for a month, for a year, for I think my current streak is on three years or something. So like it, it, it goes very, yeah, thanks. It goes very well. And that's mainly because I don't spend the time one like entire week, one entire month learning something and then not using it is because I revisit it every time. So when you're going to a DDD conference or maybe to a DDD workshop and you spend a lot of money on it and you go home and you don't do anything with it, it's sad, <laughs> like it's, it's throwing away money. And we just learned your long-term memory is still there. Huh? So like we do still have something to hold on to but your pathways will be very much overgrown. So it will take, like you need to revisit it maybe next year again in order to spend that money again in order to really be able to apply it. So rather spend shorter periods of time for a longer period of time than longer periods of times in a shorter time frame. I could have pressed that before I <laughs> realized. <laughs> All right, another tip you can do is flashcards. Flashcards are something we did a lot, I think in high school, maybe elementary school, but you can also use it as adults, <laughs> really. Uh, I spoke to some speakers on the speaker dinner and they came from France, so I decided to do my example in French. Uh, so on one side of the card, you write something you want to remember. And on the other side of the card, you write something to remember it by or a visualization. It doesn't need to be text, like it can also be a visualization because visualizations makes a lot of sense and are cool. So for this example, I have Goedemorgen DDD Europe and I want to learn in the French. So on the other side, I have Bonjour DDD Europe. <laughs> now it would be Super cool if everybody decided, okay, yeah, I'm definitely going to do that. I get my scissors, I get my paper out, I'm going to create them by hand. Amazing, great for your learning strategy because you're active, like you're working longer on the process and therefore the pathways will be stronger. But we're also in 2023. So like, I get we all want to fall back on apps. So we do have some apps uh, lately. You have Anki and Quizlet, which I pretty uh, much like, um, mainly also because they offer public card decks. So the other day I wanted to learn uh, my Splunk power user exam. I want to get it. Um, and I actually could use the card decks of fellow people around the world in order to learn for that exam. So pretty useful. Now, something else you can do is use a dictionary. And using a dictionary is actually something where everything a little bit comes together. So what you create is you have this place where you store everything that you want to learn about, your concepts, and you write down everything you know about it. And you write down like pros and cons, uh, monomics, uh, but also things where you can apply it. And also things where you don't want to apply it, like the lessons learned. Where should you not use it? And if you want to take that to another level, let's talk about study time. Study time is a dedicated moment in time. Best, wor It works best if you have it at a set time with a set frequency, which repeats itself every time. So for example, you say that every Friday morning at 8.30, I spend 30 minutes learning about a new concept. And it doesn't need to be a lot more than 30 minutes because I've talked with you guys about the working memory, right? We only have six slots. So of course you can spend an entire day, but the, those 30 minutes are really about the, the theory, like really about get learning about new concepts. And after that, you really, really need to just experience it. You need to use it. So in the week following, you're going to use it. 
And every day you're going to think about how you can use it. And there will be days when you cannot put it into practice within your work environment, right? Because it just doesn't fit. But the fact that you spend some time thinking about like, how can I use this today? And could I maybe include it in my daily task today? will make the, the, um, the con uh, consolidation stronger because you will have thought about like, okay, do where does it belong? Where can I put the hooks? Get a better understanding of the entire concept. After a week, you're going to evaluate it, see what you learned and adapt your dictionary accordingly, right? And if you really have the feeling that you understand the concepts, I would stimulate you guys to explain it to others. It's a great exam for yourself because at the moment that you are able to explain it to others, you also know that you understood it yourself, that you're able to explain it to others. And it's fun, right? Like learning together is fun, inspiring each other. And it can be that you're maybe not an extrovert and that speaking to other like in crowds or like to present something is not your thing and that's totally cool but explain it to others can also be done via a blog or maybe in a more informal way like during like a team knowledge sharing session maybe you can introduce a session where every sprint you spend 30 minutes with each other talking about what you've learned that sprint from that, we go into learning together. And I don't need to tell you about the importance because you are all here at conferences. So you guys probably know about the value of community, right? But what I want to talk about is uh, what we call the curse of expertise. And the curse of expertise is something that happens after a few years uh, when you're in the field. And it's this weird thing where suddenly people forget where they came from and that they were once a junior too. <laughs> and it's this thing where you get impatient, like maybe you have a colleague that's le that has less years in the field and you just explained it to someone and now a few hours later, this person forgot about it or this person does this, exact same thing wrong and you just get impatient like i just told you that right but it can very well be that that information was the seventh chunk <laughs> so be humble be patient and especially be kind we all came from our starting point right we all have been there and learning together is fun um but especially <laughs> if we don't get angry and like frustrated on each other. So, so be patient, be like Dory, then everything will be fine. All right. Oh, that's a big, oh, lunch block. Do you guys want to have lunch? <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm going to ignore it. It's two minutes left. Um, <laughs> so giving feedback. Um, giving feedback. Um, when I was a speech and language therapist, I learned that kids apparently don't like it when they are told they're wrong. And apparently adults also don't like it. So what we learned <laughs> as a speech, what we learned during like the, the study is that whenever they say something wrong, instead of saying you're wrong, we give indirect feedback and we just repeat it in the way that is correct. So when this kid would say, hey, towel, or I want that towel, I would say, oh, let me grab that cat for you. And you can also do that in code. Instead of saying something, someone is wrong, you can just show them an example of your code or maybe introduce them in how you see it without actually saying that something is not correct. Now, we are adults, sometimes unfortunately, but we are all adults. So sometimes we get into the situations where things are urgent. Oh, this, this is shitty, yeah? Yeah, <laughs> okay. What it says <laughs> is that, yeah, it's, it's not mirrored, so it's it, difficult for me to get away. But um, what it says is that if you need to give direct feedback, then you would do it in such a way that you don't give the solution directly, but you would just point out the issue. Give someone the opportunity to walk that pathway, to think before they search, like to, to go over that pathway instead of you just offering the solution. 
And you can also go offer guidance instead of solution, right? You can just hold a hand. All right, and with that being said, we are at the end of the talk. Uh, these are the key kit takes away. So use all your senses, uh, actively apply what you learn, uh, find someone that cor can correct you. So learn together, right? And automate your long-term memory retrieval. These are the sources, and with that being said, thank you for your attention. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs>